Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all for coming and thank you VSC for having me back. It's kind of surreal being here because this was actually my first residency um, ever. So it's, it feels crazy to just be back here and it's a time warp so everything looks the same. <laughs> so I like to start lectures with, by embarrassing myself but showing you a little bit about um, <laughs> who I knew I was before I knew that this was a thing when I declared that I was an artist at six years old. This is the document, earliest documentation of it, but my mom says that I was saying this since I was three. So it's also, um, interestingly enough, the first appearance I think of defiance in my life because um, both of my parents are in medicine and there are no artists in my family. And no matter how many different strangers, friends of the family would ask me, I knew and I always made sure they knew that I was going to be an artist, not a doctor or a nurse like my mom and dad. So um, <laughs> I think that you know, declaring that at such a young age just permeates my life to this day. And um, it's also representative of the subject matter that I've explored throughout my work. So, sorry, going back. So I'm just gonna take you through sort of the, the evolution of my work from 2008 when I was in grad school at Parsons and uh, because it provides some context, just based on the way that I work, um, sourcing my own work uh, as fodder for, for new material. And I also, this is more of an intimate setting than the lecture hall, so if you have a question while the slide is up, please feel free to ask. It also takes some pressure off of me to talk too much. <laughs> but, um, so this is some of the earliest work that I was making in grad school that was heavily influenced by The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. And I was exploring um, the awkwardness of childhood, uh, puberty, and discovering a sense of, of self. Uh, just to give some background that I think isn't as well known, but I was um, a, a studio art, excuse me, I was an art teacher for middle school and high school for nearly 10 plus years um, and left to pursue my MFA. So that was, uh, had a big influence on me. And I taught in the South Bronx and East Harlem for many years. So I was really exploring um, the ways that, or the mantra to a certain extent of children should be seen and not heard. But in, in my paintings, the subjects or the, the children were actually ignoring or disregarding the viewer. And they were more so doing the looking at or being looked at. Um, they were engaging in play that bordered on sexuality and violence, but also innocence. I was really interested in the way or this awareness of the act of looking and locating yourself in relationship to the subject you're looking at. And so in these paintings, you know, you're rendered invisible. The viewers are rendered invisible. And I'm trying to also, I was trying to implicate the viewer and make you complicit in their actions regardless of their ambiguity. So a lot of the conversations up until this point um, I don't know how many of you have experienced this, but I'm sure many of you, if you went to grad school, have, where people, when you're a painter, they always tell you not to paint. Raise your hand if you've heard that, if you're a painter. Okay. <laughs> They're always encouraging you not to paint and to try something else, like performance or video. And that was one of the conversations, or many of the conversations that I had while I was in grad school. And I was a little frustrated, not only by this, this um, by other people trying to encourage me, or professors encouraging me not to paint, but also I was discouraged by the conversations around the work at that time. There was a lot more emphasis on uh, the race of the figures and people were not really exploring or, or looking deeply into the more formal uh, concerns that I was exploring. So I was paying closer attention to what was not being said than what was being said. And it made me take a step back and reevaluate once I graduated. And so I was, you know, making these paintings a few years post-grad and felt a bit stuck, kept thinking about the conversations that weren't being had, and I felt like the paintings had exhausted themselves and I wanted a, a shift or a challenge. So that combined with like, not feeling uh, stimulated by the process and also my inability to afford a studio space in Brooklyn <laughs> led to my decision to work on a smaller scale. So what I did was I, you know, I use air quotes, I borrowed the, the school printer where I was teaching and, and just made prints of just color copies of all the work I had made up until that point, all the paintings, all the drawings. And something just compelled me to, to collage them. 
So I just started cutting up all those images and they became these really strange, fun and playful uh, collages. And so this is the first collage that I made. And for me, it really allowed me to um, embrace the expediency and intimacy of drawing, which came more naturally to me. And so I felt this, the collage work was most closely connected to my innermost thoughts and subconscious. I was creating work that walked the line between fantasy and reality, evoked surrealism, and also fused interior and exterior spaces. So I was able to keep the codex that I, or language that I developed over the years, but still um, pare it down to its essential elements and still allow it to retain, the works to retain a, a certain amount of power. I also was, uh, in a sense, creating the psychological version of the figure in an unorthodox bodily form. So I was creating figures that emulated or, or were visual interpretations of emotions. So in many of them, the, the figures are somewhat bizarre. They're not necessarily what we would consider as being whole figures or whole uh, people. But in many instances, they are, even though they're missing limbs or they have featureless faces. They're also like gender conscious, and, and so I was kind of pushing against constructions of gender in these works. Many of the titles um, occurred after the pieces were made, and I consider myself a language hoarder, so anytime I hear a phrase or a word or I read something in a book, I'm always documenting it in my sketchbook or on my iPhone, just, just archiving it. And then sometimes I'm just looking through that archive and whatever you know, draws my attention or feels relevant to the work I make, that's the uh, title that I give it. So some of them are common phrases, like these two, um, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. So that's an excerpt from that. Um, I think that was a nursery rhyme or poem or something. Uh, and then home is where the heart is, is the sort of excerpt from that uh, title. So I'm trying to change the context of the work, but also still remain somewhat ambiguous by not giving too much away in the titles. I think there's a tendency for people to become too dependent on the titles and not really look more introspectively at the work itself. So collage for me felt very performative. Um, it was a way for me, a means for me to wrestle with painting but also engage my entire body in many different ways or engage my body itself in different ways. So I found this book by Linda Nochlin who passed away last year called The Body in Pieces, The Fragment as a Metaphor of Modernity. And I feel like I couldn't have said it any better than she did. <laughs> she says, um, it kind of sums up in one aspect, of my, one aspect of my work that consumes me. She says, I do not wish to propose here some grandiose, all-encompassing theory of the fragment in relation to the concept of modernity. That would go against the grain of my project. On the contrary, what I propose is that in examining, in a roughly historical order, a series of separate, though sometimes related, cases of the body in pieces, a paradigm is, con is constructed of the subject under consideration. I firmly believe that the fragment and visual representation must be treated as a series of discrete, ungeneralizable situations. Above all, I would feel obliged to dissect or even deconstruct the very concept of modernity, itself a constantly changing, discursive formation in which the trope of fragmentation plays a shifty and ever-shifting role, with as much care as I lavished on the fragment itself. But, but that would be another undertaking altogether. So this resolved the work for me and settled into the language uh, and my understanding of the figure. It's a great book, it's really short. It's only like 100 pages. <laughs> that was wordy, but it's, only, it's a really short book. So at this point, I had been making collages for about a year. Um, some of those collages I made here, actually, that I showed. And I really enjoyed just the intuitiveness and playfulness of making them. But I wanted to return to painting because I am a painter at heart. And what I really enjoyed about collage is that a huge percentage of image making is already done for you. And the language that I developed was already completed. I just had to reassemble and recontextualize it. 
And I felt like the best way to sort of bring this new body of work back into painting was to translate some of these collages as paintings. And so this is a side by side of the left is a collage and the right is a painting, a diptych. And I started experimenting with different mediums um, that created diff like texture and depth. So what's not really visible in the slide, but this is gold leaf here. Uh, this fence is, um, I think it's a hard gel or molding paste. So it's carved into and, and so I've removed some areas so it has some texture and dimension. These uh, flowers here were, uh, it was a print on acrylic polymer. So at this point, residencies came into play and really had an impact on my work. And when I made this painting, I was at the Golden Artist Colors residency. And you have unlimited access to all of their custom materials, all their acrylic paints. They own Williamsburg, so you just have, apply to it basically is what I'm saying to you, if you're interested. But you have access to all different materials and you learn a lot of different techniques. So. I was able to bring that into this painting. Pen and ink, uh, mica flakes, all of that was in here. Then the appearance of black glitter, which is sort of flattened here, but in her mouth, there's, um, I applied some black glitter, really fine black glitter. And I started to incorporate that to achieve a greater sense of depth and a feeling of like dis-ease you, that you feel when you look at black velvet. I was trying to emulate that by using glitter. And I was also thinking about the uh, 60s ideology, or black is beautiful, which dispelled the notion that black people are unattractive. And I thought that what if I could literally make black beautiful in these paintings? And this, uh, her breasts are actually an acrylic polymer, and that's basically an acrylic, like clear tar gel or any of those acrylic mediums that is poured onto a white, um, clear plastic, like plastic drop cloth, and cured. So it becomes like this uh, really pliable plastic that you can paint or adhere in, uh, to the surface. So it was like an element of collage that was coming into the work as well, Can the painting. Hanging down the road in here? Yes. So this is wood panel, so yeah, it's hanging, <laughs> dripping off the frame, mm -hmm. off the panel. <laughs> So again, glitter is functioning now as both a mask and a symbol of pride. So her whole face is composed of glitter. And I have to say that I was really disappointed when Anish Kapoor um, pat patented Va Vanta Black. I was hoping to use that, which is supposed to be the, the deepest black scientist created it. I don't know, he, he patented it so no one else could use it. So bl glitter kind of took the place of that for me. <laughs> I also don't have millions of dollars to buy it from him if I wanted to, so. So the more that I began to paint these, fi these hybrid figures, the more they transcended age and gender. And in this one, um, I didn't realize it at the time, obviously now I have some, some perspective and knowledge, but I was inspired by a Seinfeld, e Seinfeld episode, which is now I realize really problematic, um, where he was on a date with someone with man hands. And so it was just like, how are, people, how are people's understanding of gender um, coming across in pop culture, and how can I play with that in my paintings? Like, what does that actually mean? And does that then complicate your understanding of the genders of these figures even more? Or the fluidity of gender? So I'm also, I also reference um, a lot of the history paintings. I'm looking at, I look at religious paintings and I love their, like, the peculiarity and awkwardness of them how there's this like both spirituality, subservience, and power embedded in them all simultaneously. And I wanted these art historical hints to be provocative, provocative enough to encourage a deeper looking or deeper engagement for, with the viewer. I also wanted these figures, these hybrid figures, to be central to the narrative as opposed to um, these subsidiary elements or these accessories. So again, these are still more mixed media paintings. I mean, this one as well, it's black glitter in the background. Um, the limbs are UPO, oil paint on UPO paper, which is like a plastic slick paper. Uh, so there's a lot of elements that are collaged in this painting. And so more collage elements coming into these panel paintings uh, as well. And so now the figure's becoming a lot more abstract. 
um, definitely more collage-like. And I'm using some of the same papers that I was using in my smaller collages. So while at uh, Fine Arts Work Center residency, I started to um, learn about monoprinting. I wasn't familiar with much printmaking at that point. I'd taken like a silk screening class in my early 20s, but I fell in love with monoprinting. And so I, this is the only monoprints I ever made, but um, a lot of my monoprints were completed not from the first, what they call the first pulls, but usually from working back into the plate and working into the ghost print. But I love that it was the, its ability for the ability of monoprinting to capture like the mark and gestures of my hand, and yet it was still left up to chance because I didn't know what would happen after I rolled it through the press. And so those first pulls, those first um, monoprint pulls, which, were, which I deemed failures, I used as fodder for collage paintings. So this is all built up from uh, monoprints that I was going to discard that I didn't want to use as standalone prints. So it's just me hoarding more material, hoarding <laughs> prints, all these things, and using them to create these paintings. So now we're in probably 2013 with my work. So again, some of the references, um, my like obsession with the Baroque and Renaissance period, specifically Baroque period, I started to research in depth. And I love that um, the aesthetic and conceptual characteristics of the Baroque era were both like stylistically contradictory and complex. But I love that it, there was a desire to, or the artwork of that period evoked emotional states in dramatic ways. And so I aim for this in my collage installations because at this point, I wanted to take the work off the wall and, and sort of break the constraints of the um, rectangular square. And so the, the compositions of the Baroque paintings became inspiration for these larger, more immersive collage installations. I wanted to engulf the viewer in the work, I wanted to break the picture plane, and I wanted these works to exist like, directly on the wall and not on a, on a structure. So now the collages have gotten much bigger, much more immersive. I'm using, you know, I'm going to uh, thrift stores and finding like old frames and other material, fabric, and incorporating that, combining that with paper, paint on paper, um, print, printed material like monoprints and um, silk screens and creating these like more immersive collage installations. So now they're very intimate yet playful and they're engaging my entire body because sometimes I'm recreating all this, um, these symbols that I've used over time through, uh, through printmaking, through large scale painting on, on canvas or paper. And so I'm really involving, engaging my whole body in the work. So in this one in particular, this is probably the first of that series where I re literally recreated all these symbols using um, silk screen. So this wave pattern, this wave design, the leaf is actually like an 11 by 15 foot <laughs> silk screened surface. Um, took forever and I had carpal tunnel pains <laughs> for a while after that. But it's mon there's mono printing in here, there, um, there's ink on UPO paper, paint, pen and ink, so it's a little bit of all the techniques that I've been using over time sort of collapse into this one work. I also started to explore more immersive, a more literally immersive experience uh, that incorporated more three-dimensional elements. So this was at AIR Gallery in 2015, um, where I found like black litter wallpaper, and that's what's on the background, that's on the wall and projected some of the character, one of the characters from my uh, collages and paintings onto the surface. I combined it with some collage paper elements and um, a large five foot uh, plaster leg.
So in this work, I mean, I was still working through like painting, collaging, and printmaking, but then I encountered new obstacles, new sort of obstructions to work through with the resin floor, um, trying to understand how, to, how these works can occupy space and still feel very um, physical. So this is the show that I had um, in 2017, two years ago, called Try a Little Tenderness. And so with this, with the title of this exhibition, I was referring to an Otis Redding song um, from, I think, the 60s that implores men to show caring or more caring towards women. And they also, some people say that he was also singing about women's class struggles and heteronormative values that equate um, womanhood to ideals of beauty and male companionship. So I was trying to push against that in this, this body of work and also install my work in a unique way. I never sort of brought my collage installations and paintings together at the same time. So this, this space worked out perfectly for that because I had these paintings on, on panel opposite the collage. So this installation for me really um, challenged the viewer's interaction and engagement with the history of painting, but also with my own mythology, and um, sort of fragment the body in, you, in a very different way than I had before. Still like these amalgamations of girlhood. Um, I'm still exploring constructions of gender and sort of the psychological version of the figure, but creating this more, um, large-scale, non-linear narrative. You see the pigtails and the fingers, reoccurring motifs and representations of girlhood, but that doesn't always mean that these figures are female or girls or women. I also started to incorporate areas of, of I, what I have to call like pauses or punctuation marks with these stripes, just stripes on the panel. So they, for me, operated as like, um, sometimes they were commas, sometimes they were periods, but they were a moment for, you, for the viewer to sort of pause as they're following this sort of narrative. So then it came to this massive 40-foot <laughs> collage, which was a site-specific commission. Um, and with the commission that the union provides, it's named after an artist by the name of Wanda Ewing, who was a printmaker well-known in the Omaha area. She taught at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And I'd never heard of her until I was approached to, to make work for the show and, and mount a solo exhibition. But what I realized is that we were sort of kindred spirits. I mean, there were so many similarities in our work. Uh, we both were exploring fragment, fragmented depictions of women's bodies. Uh, we, we enjoyed reimagining like iconic paintings, especially of nude figures. And when I looked at her work, I was like, well, this is perfect. I mean, in a way I wanted to honor her, but also show, um, sort of take a moment conceptually to, to co bring together my interests and hers. And so I extracted some of her figures. So these black figures with red lips are her um, reoccurring characters in her work. This, this leg back here that's bent, it's a really deep brown, and this pink leg were hers. And I brought that and combined that with my own uh, recurring uh, motifs in my work. So the pigtails now have become landscapes. Um, the water, which you probably remember from the earlier collage installation. And this figure here is actually, was ex extracted from the first collage that I made that I showed. Um, and this figure in particular underwent multiple iterations before sort of landing in this space. Um, this is, I mean, it's all different media. It's, uh, there's printmaking, there's uh, mono printing, there's some acrylic polymer skins. Uh, silk screen, found papers, paint on canvas and on papers, a little bit of everything in this massive collage. It's also a nod to some very well-known paintings. 
The Bathers by Cezanne, his series, as well as uh, Luncheon in the Grass by Manet. So I wanted to construct a, f a world where like, my paper figures and landscapes interacted with, with Wanda Ewing's depictions of like voluptuous, unequivocally black bodies, but also incorporate the repetition of geometric motifs and the use of landscape to control the composition. I think for me, this piece is also similar to Manet's uh, refusal to conform to convention, which is where how this painting came about. Um, you know, having a, this nude woman clothed uh, amongst clothed men, I think is very similar to me uh, in s sort of stark contrast to the ways in which I contrasted the black bodies against and within this pastoral landscape. So this is the show that's up at, um, well, any questions so far? I'll stop, I'll pause for a minute. Yeah. I just wonder, I, I see a lot of yellow gloves. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what that means, means to you. It changes, that's like my answer, non-answer, but I can, I can tell you where it originated from, um, I wanted to be an animator when I was in, when I was an undergrad and I actually was an intern at an animation studio, so I was heavily influenced by like Warner Brothers cartoons as a child of the 80s. And there, you would never, in the Warner Brothers cartoons, you would rarely see the adult figure. You would either hear them, like in Charlie Brown, you'd hear you know, the want, want, want on the phone. Or in Tom and Jerry, you had this really problematic depiction of the mammy, which was supposed to be their, their, their mother, but you'd only see her hands and her legs and her, her bedroom slippers. And so I was, I guess I extracted that from some cartoon that I saw and I thought a lot about like domesticity and domestic work. Like what are, yellow gloves are usually worn by women oftentimes doing dishes. And so it sometimes represents an authority figure. Just as the hand, the pointing finger also is that, um, holds that same representation, but it does change. I think that's the first time I answered that honestly. Without being, without being ambiguous, I try to hold back some things because it changes, yeah, yeah. you know. But but that's that was the origin of it. <laughs> so with this show, I mean, I never thought about my work as um, depicting darkness or the night. I mean, in some ways, it is conceptually depicting the dark or things that you know are swept under the rug, things that are taboo. So it was interesting when the curator approached me to show in this. Um, and to be a part of this amazing group exhibition, this big painting show. And um, she brought together work over a four year period. So the paintings on the right are from um, 2015, my time in Iowa, at the University of Iowa. The painting directly opposite with the, the Seinfeld reference, um, that was from like 2000, I think 13 or 14. On the left, that painting I made in 2012 or 13, and then, sorry, the painting here, this is the first of this new series that I'm working on that I made in 2017. So it's really interesting to look at my work and like very, you know, small number of works in relation to one another over the course of four years almost. Um, and, and in this context of thinking about darkness. I think that had a huge influence on the work that I have been <laughs> making now and that I made for this show that I have up at BU. So um, the Union show was in 2017. Mass Mocha is currently up, but that show went up uh, in March of 2018. And um, I wasn't really making as much work. I was making a lot of drawings. <coughs> it's hard to make work when you're teaching, to be honest. <laughs> During the school year, I, I don't get a lot of work done. I mostly make a lot of work during my winter break and summers where I'm just at residencies or just in my studio and focus. And I discovered these really cool markers um, called, like they're watercolor marker, markers called Tombow. And I started making these drawings and using markers. And I'd never made colored drawings before. I mean, I'd always worked with pen and ink usually on like brown craft, craft paper or just small thumbnail sketches, rough thumbnail sketches in my sketchbook. And that was the only preliminary work that I did for any paintings. And 
I don't know what happened, but something, something did. I'm, I can't really figure out where, but I think I was starting, I was kind of starting over after the show at the Union, and drawing is a comfort zone for me. That's where I return to when I'm uncertain of where to go next. And so this is the, a series that I call the Duality Series, and I wanted to, it started out as a, me wanting to sort of create work that looked like my paintings and my collages had a baby. And I didn't know <laughs> what that looked like. I thought that would look like mixed media work. It actually, um, it ended up being very much about painting. But I wanted to prov provide a different way of understanding wholeness or completion, again, through the fragmentation of the body. Um, and so I made a lot of these drawings and decided that they would be paintings. So for me, it meant making paintings, making it look like my paintings and collages had a baby. Um, for me, I went immediately to scale. I knew that the works had to be big. I also hadn't worked really large since grad school. Like those paintings were on wood panel, and they were probably about, um, one of the biggest ones I think was maybe like 100 and 120 inches or so, something like that. So I was explore, exploring transparency in these works, color, the, the figures are definitely even more abstracted now. They're becoming one with the backgrounds that they're inhabiting. But I love that I could, you know, blend and, and overlay these different colored markers to create a sense of depth. And so I turned a lot of those drawings into, into paintings. And um, so I'm showing you some install shots of the show solo show that I have up at BU, um, Tara mentioned. And I had more ambitious goals. I wanted to create this, again, an, an installation. I wanted the paintings and these like sculptures that I wanted to make to exist in the same space. But um, <laughs> I had more ambitious goals than time. And uh, it ended up, once I started making these paintings last uh, summer, I just got really immersed in the paintings themselves. I was just engrossed in like painting like what the material could do, how it changed, and how colors function in this, these large spaces, these huge canvases. And they could still, these figures could still envelop you in a way. So the, the drawings became blueprints for this work. I'm exploring, you know, the space between flatness, um, the gaze is, has come back into play, and the idea of these mirrored or multiple figures or bodies. So I wanted to create depth, not only through color, but by altering the surface of the, of the painting itself. And so, obviously, it just really flattens the work, but there are a lot of different uh, surfaces in this painting. There's a matte surface, so this black is um, like a matte black that I found by an artist who was also upset at Anish Kapoor and came up with a black that's called Not For Anish Kapoor Black. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> he's out in the UK, it's, I think his name is Stuart Semple, if you wanna order that stuff, but um, it changes because it's, it's so matte that you feel like you're getting sort of swallowed in or sucked into the black, it's so dense. They're high gloss surfaces, so there's some enamel paint in this area here that I've been using, uh, sign painter's paint, like one shot. And I'm glazing, and I'm also using color as a trickster. So color is another character in this work, where the longer you stare at certain like stripes or certain areas of this painting, there are things that sort of, sort of vibrate and move, and, and sort of go, there's like a back and forth, like the stripes sort of recede, some of them come forward, um, I was really trying to push that, that optical illusion in these paintings. I like that this mirror image, which it's, no, they're not exactly the same, these figures, but it provided you know, access to the private and the collective, right? You feel like you're looking in on this really intimate exchange or this intimate interaction, but 
these these figures are are together. They're they're touching. There are certain elements that are close to touching some parts of their body. They wanted to lure you into this experience um, physically and emotionally through through touch or almost touching. So there's noticeably a shift in color in this work from the previous uh, show at the Union. And so I'm exploring dark light and what that, that concept of dark light. Um, I wanted color to, to sort of pose more timely and nuanced questions about multiplicity and formalism. And I wanted to evoke the blue-gray light of twilight and create a more sort of contemplative approach to seeing by changing my color palette. In a lot of ways, I think about my work as operating the same way Maria Lasnik talks about her work. She describes her work as like body sensation or body awareness painting. And I think a lot about that a lot as well. Like I try to sort of stay ahead of rational decision making in the work and just trust the images, allow the images to discover themselves. And so although they're very similar in some ways to the paint, to the drawings that you saw, it's not the same because I'm now, now I'm working with paint and it becomes about that material itself, not about just the forms and replicating what I did with the drawing. Again, the titles are, <laughs> are quirky sometimes. They're, they're nodding and alluding to something else. But um, in this one in particular, I wanted this painting and a lot of these paintings to address the way issues of representation and the, the idea of the black body, the historical body, but not using black or brown bodies, right? Because then they become about color too. And so in this one, I was inspired by New Descending the Staircase. Um, also looking at Robert Crumb, his illustrations, his cartoons, and combining or collapsing like high and low art into one, into one painting. There's elements of the visible invisible in these works, or I'm thinking a lot about how, um, how that relates to my own personal experience in the world or many people's experiences in the world of being sort of rendered invisible and, and sometimes being made hyper-visible, depending on the spaces you occupy, occupy. There are those yellow gloves again. So in, in some ways, these figures also, um, they're a negation of tradition, a form of negation of tradition. I wanted them, the complexity of identity to be explored from a multiple, multiplicity of perspectives and have these paintings invoke thought and not provide any one singular answer, which is also why my titles continue to be sort of um, elusive. This one in particular for me is, um, these figures are becoming parts of, part of the architecture. I mean, this, the hand or the arm is, is, has become like a piece of wood. I noticed that's starting to happen in a lot of my drawings too, where you're uncertain of where the body begins and where the space itself ends. Um, there's this fusion that's occurring with these new works. I just try to get out of its way and let it do its thing and not think, overthink it. <laughs> So, I mean, there's, again, there's graphite and pigtails, there's enamel paint, a little bit of like glazing with these like orbs, orbs of light in the background. Excuse the typo. And I have to be honest and say that it's still really hard to talk about these works because they're brand new. Um, so questions are, are encouraged at this point, but. <laughs> I was making these at Bemis uh, last summer and um, surrounded by like brick walls in this old warehouse, which I think influenced the work, especially in this painting here. Building up textures. I mean, these are both black, right? There's that, that Stuart Semple, not for Anish Kapoor black on this figure. 
and then a two black here. And I really, I'm, I teach color theory sometimes at Wellesley, and I'm so obsessed with Yosef Albers concept of color theory, interaction of color. And I was trying to really push that even further in these works intentionally. So how can, I mean, color is relative, right? It's the only relative medium, which means that you never see color in its natural state. You never see it in its natural form. It's always um, seen in relation to other things, whether it's light or space or other colors. It shifts and changes no matter what. It's never seen naturally. So I love using like black on black, using these different blacks, this matte black, this high gloss black with um, enamel black. I mean with, um, excuse me, with a satin black. So kind of like a little bit of what I was doing with the black glitter is happening with, with this, the way I'm using black paint, different types of black paint. It's also a little bit of, um, I mean, humor, I don't really talk about it, but it is an important part of my work. And some of these paintings I do find very funny. I find them comical. The fact that they're these figures that are, I mean, it's really tender also because they're these figures that are sharing a nipple. Um, which is like absurd and kind of bizarre, but also funny and quirky. Maybe that's just my sense of humor, but. <laughs> trying to push that a little bit. And this is a little bit of a different painting. Um, I'm obsessed with Gustin, Philip Gustin, and his heads and the way he paints heads. What's that? And the feet, yeah, and his hands, everything. It's just I love his work, um, not his abstractions, like his later work <laughs> that he became well known for. And I wanted to make this totem painting. And I was like looking at his work, and I wanted to stack these figures, and I didn't, it wasn't working as a drawing. I have some really failed, hideous drawings that didn't work out. And um, sometimes I use Photoshop, and this is an instance where I use Photoshop and went back to, I'm going to scroll really quickly to, I went back to this painting, and I just cropped that head in Photoshop and stacked it and basically made that entire painting, this entire painting in Photoshop. And it's like, okay, I'm just going to project that onto the canvas and replicate it. And it looks exactly like the digital image, but... It's just sometimes different, different you know, approaches work. And it, it did exactly what I want because sometimes it looks like a head and other times I've heard it looks like a pigtail or a braid or um, just a bunch of eyes. I don't, it's a strange painting. And then the, the mirroring that's happening is confusing because you're not sure if it's a reflection or if it's just a continuous um, line of, of heads that are stacked. And those are, so those, those are the, the moments where I really enjoy sort of playing the role of, a, of the trickster as an artist. So, you, you know, confusing the viewer, but then there are all these other sort of interpretations that can be made from the work based on how you're seeing it. <laughs> I was wondering when that question was going to come about. So... See, if we were in a lecture hall, I probably wouldn't answer these questions as honestly. This is really intimate. So I'm going to answer it honestly. I'm not going to be evasive. Um, <laughs> the kneecaps, when I was a little kid, so my earlier work, I was also looking at um, family photos. I didn't mention that, but I had just a ton of, of childhood photos hanging in my studio in grad school, and I used that as sort of a departure point for those works, um, as well as literature. And I remember as a kid always thinking, like I would see patterns, I would see faces in different patterns, like wood grain patterns, I'm sure everyone sort of had that experience. Different textiles, you would just see these faces. And I would see a face or a mouth in my kneecaps. I just thought I had these really kind of, I was a skinny kid, <laughs> like all legs, and these like really, these kneecaps that folded over each other, I thought. I'm probably being dramatic, but <laughs> that's, that's my memory of it. And I love that I could make these kneecaps sort of nostalgic and as a nod to, to the way that I looked at kneecaps as a kid, but also their form of protection. So they serve these dual purposes, their protection. So it's like, are they protected from something? Are they protecting you from something? There's like multi-layered meaning behind kneecaps and knee pads. 
So I wanted, I was trying to obscure that a bit. Like, so they're, sometimes they're actual knees and other times they're, they're padding and protection. <laughs> yeah, I would make them talk. I was a, I was a strange, <laughs> I was a strange artsy kid. <laughs> what can I say? And um, I'm going to end with this quote by Toni Morrison. I think it's pretty timely and never gets old, unfortunately. But a lot of the work that I made, I, just, I spoke about just my own personal studio practice, but I think about all of my work as sort of a collaborative um, exchange, so to speak. And working with BWA has sort of illuminated for me how that's possible as an artist. I think collaboration can be daunting, it can be frustrating, but there are many different ways that we all collaborate whether it's through conversations that we have with one another, whether it's through making work together, being, you know, um, being a part of a collective. I mean, I think this is really, it's really important time for all of us to find our ways to um, not get so bogged down by what's happening in the world, but also to, to sort of remain hopeful. And I like to try to think that art and the work that I make can do that, the work that we all make can and does do that. And so I always think about this quote by Toni Morrison that I think she said this at a speech in like the 90s. So unfortunately, it's still relevant. Um, yeah, that's, that's the last slide. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>